All right, everyone. The the initial torrent of participants has slowed to a trickle, so we will uh, carry on with the seminar. Mark's in charge of the slides. If you can scroll down to the next one, Mark, that would be fantastic. Um, just to say that a recording will be available afterwards. Mark's words of wisdom are going to be so wonderful. You'll want to listen to them again and again, I'm sure. Um, as we go along, please do pop questions in the Q&A box, which we'll monitor. The, the way these things go, we'll probably uh, do those at the end rather than as we go along but we'll see how we go uh, and in that regard if you can just make it clear in your question which slide or point you're referring to sometimes when we we come to them at the end out of context it's it's not always easy to uh, recall what the question relates to so if you could be very specific that would be fantastic and and mark will answer all those difficult questions the more difficult the better please that's what he wants um and uh, obviously there'll be an opportunity, please uh, stick them in the, the Q&A or, or afterwards, we will be seeking your feedback and your suggestions for future topics for these in-house in focus sessions. Um, so I'm Simon Pedley, I'm a partner in the disputes team at Mills and Reeve and I'm uh, chairing this session of our in-house in focus seminars, that's the easy part, but I'm gonna hand you over to the brains of the outfit, Mark Pierce, who is actually gonna be telling you stuff that uh, you will want and need to know. So, Mark, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Simon. Um, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm, I think this is the second of the in-house in focus uh, sessions I've spoken at on intellectual property issues. Um, uh, what are we going to talk about today? Um, five topics I'm going to pick up on today. The, the first is online infringement, um, which has seen something of uh, a, a, a boom um, in, in lockdown times. A number of our clients are seeing copyright claims in relation to website content, so we can talk about that. Um, an interesting case around um, employee ownership or employer ownership of intellectual property and how changing working patterns may, may be affecting that, which again, in these, uh, in these times of lockdown and post-lockdown and hybrid working seems particularly relevant. Gonna have a very quick look not, not a detailed analysis of, of IP after Brexit, but really a look at how it's working. And are we beginning to see some divergence um, between European law and UK law? Um, and then finally, an interesting patent case on the, the importance of, uh, of keeping inventions under, under wraps and confidential before filing for protection and what that can mean in a practical environment. So um, online infringement. A couple of statistics, first of all, um, one from the Organisation for uh, Economic Cooperation and Development. There you can see that, that in a pre-pandemic world, trade in counterfeit goods was 3.3% of world trade, and that's a number that's going up. Uh, more strikingly, um, the Intellectual Property Office uh, has a tracker survey for copyright infringement um, and in March this year, that tracker estimated that the overall level of infringement for this is copyright content online, um, excluding digital visual images, was 23% of material on sale. That's I, I I thought it would be high, but 23% is a staggeringly high number. Um, and anecdotally, for sure. But uh, but anecdotally, what we are we are seeing a significant growth in in the level of online intellectual property rights infringement in lockdown. The more the more online activity there is, the easier it is to infringe. I think. Um, and so actually, um, what what can you do about that? I think uh, we'll we'll look at it. But but the first thing is to make sure that your rights are are properly protected and a policing strategy. We're gonna look at a case study we've been involved in, um, which actually, interestingly, related to fake exam certificates rather than anything else. Um, and, and in this case, uh, what was happening was that the, uh, the defendant was issuing exam certificates with, with our clients' trademarks, our clients' names on. Um, they were awarding bodies, um, concealing identity, um, and online, many of you will be familiar with who is searches um, to identify the identity of uh, of the owner of a website or the registrant of a, of a domain name. Um, and 
some of you will be familiar with the fact that post GDPR, who is searches don't really work anymore. Um, the uh, the registrant bodies have decided in their wisdom that um, the identity of a registrant for a domain name is personal information, even where domain names are registered names of companies, um, and therefore they will not provide that data to uh, to who is searches. Um, there are there are ways of getting to that information, but it means making an application to the registrant. To be honest with you, I think it's. I think it's wrong as a point of, of, of law on GDPR. I think there's a there's a legitimate interest to know who the registrant of a domain name is. If you want to register a domain name, you should not be uh, concerned at having your identity as the registrant of that domain name being identified. But who is search is not as effective as they were. Um, and then there's obtaining evidence. Um, and typically we'd, we'd look at trap purchases. So if you do come across websites where your, your products, your, your rights are being infringed with counterfeit goods, getting a trap purchase, buying a sample of the counterfeit goods, and also getting screenshots of the website, um, which, is, um, which, which has the, the infringing goods offered for sale on it or, or, or is the infringement itself. If you can't identify the, uh, the registrant, um, and in this case, the exam certificates case, we were unable to do that because they'd use a false name. You can you can apply to serve proceedings on an email address, uh, even if that's an info at style email address. Um, and, and we got that. Um, and if no defence is served, obviously, you can go for summary judgment. That will have the effect, if nothing else, of at least getting the website taken down. Um, there is, unfortunately, in, in, in this, an element of whack-a-mole with really persistent infringers, because if you get a website taken down, they can pop up with another website. But um, the, at the moment, the, the, that's the best you can do and until you can identify who is behind these schemes. Um, but uh, in this case, the exam certificates case, the order we got, our main objectives were firstly to get a, a, a publicity order so that we could tell the world about the fake certificates and, and make sure that people weren't being confused and also have an order that we could use to get the domain name registrar to take down the domain name. Um, so what are the steps you should be taking? Well, the, the, the start of dealing with online infringement is to have a comprehensive IP strategy. It's to make sure that your key rights are, are registered. There is no doubt that in any enforcement action, having a registered right makes it far easier to enforce than having an unregistered right. You, you can use unregistered rights that are passing off, can be used to stop counterfeit goods um, but if you've got a registration um, it's going to be much stronger and it's much easier the, the 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 evidential burden of winning a trademark infringement case is so much lower than winning a passing off case um, and a monitoring policy for infringements um, which is um, which is sensible and proportional um, and if brand protection is at the core of a business, then it's worth looking at. There are a number of, of, of providers of online policing services, um, and it's worth it's worth looking at those. If not, then then actually having somebody who, who spends some time, maybe once a week, once a month, doing some Google searching um, and having a look at what's out there is a is is very much a second best, but it's but it's better than nothing. But having a policy as to how you are monitoring infringements, um, so yeah, internal or external service providers for that. There are tools to identify domain name registrants. As I say, you can make applications to the registrars, um, and and clearly before before making contact with a potential defendant, make sure your evidence is in place. Um, if you if you make contact before you've got the evidence, then you're going to find it very difficult to get evidence at a later date because they they may. They may just move on that, that whack-a-mole point. What are your possible uh, routes to, to bringing down infringing activity? Domain name registries, where, where it's a domain name itself, which is, which is leading the infringement. So lookalike websites and, and cyber squatting is still prevalent. We see a lot of examples of cyber squatting. In fact, so what I was dealing with this morning before the seminar I was advising a client on a, on a cyber squatting issue, talking to platform providers, uh, so if it's if it's infringement on eBay or uh, one of the sort of equivalents or Amazon, then the platform providers will have in most cases a takedown procedure. 
Um, we have tried, I have to say, with, with limited success to work through payment providers. The banks all offer services whereby they should, in theory, discontinue payments to uh, infringing websites. Um, we have been, I think it'd be fair to say, unimpressed by the willingness of the banks to actually pick up that cudgel. Um, and then there's the police and select property crimes units, trading standards or customs. We find varying degrees of success with those. It tends to be a question of who, uh, of whether you get an investigator that is uh, invested in, in your particular case. We've, we've, for instance, recently just found a trading standards officer who is very interested in another fake certificates case and, um, uh, and is really pushing that forward very thoroughly. Um, but, uh, and again, with the police and social property crime unit, uh, we've had cases where they've been very keen to take up a case and others where, where they've been less interested. And obviously, um, where it's goods coming into the country um, from, for instance, Chinese websites um, or shippers, you know, using Amazon coming in from China, customs can be, can be very effective, um, customs notices. Uh, and then if, if those don't work, what are, the, what are your options for escalation? Well, there are litigation options. Um, there is the Intellectual Property Enterprise Court, as well as the High Court, um, for, for, for sort of smaller value and theoretically quicker litigation, still not extremely cheap. Um, but of course, all of those rely on being able to identify a defendant and being able to serve a defendant. Um, although, as I say, in the, in the fake certificates case that I mentioned at the top, uh, we were able to get an order against a, effectively a John Doe order. Um, and interestingly, that was then appealed by the defendant who even on appeal refused to properly identify themselves, gave a fake name in, in the appeal documentation, which, which went down with the court, as you can imagine it, it would do. Copyright claims and website content. And again, I don't, I'm not sure what's driven this, but we've definitely seen an increase in the number of approaches to clients where somebody in the marketing department or whatever department is responsible for the website has taken a photograph, taken a stock image from the website um, and get what I, colleagues told me I shouldn't call them ambulance chasing letters, but I'm going to call them ambulance chasing letters. And it's on the slide that there are uh, a number of practices that make a business out of sending letters claiming copyright infringement by the use of images on website and uh, interestingly uh, we're seeing a growing number of them coming from firms in the European Union what do you do if you if you if you get one of these well the first thing is uh, that it's important to understand obviously that that an image on the on, on the web is a copyright image in all likelihood, it's you know, if it's a photograph, it's very likely that it's still in copyright. It will have been a copyright image to start with, so it's a copyright work. Um, and that the very fact that it's available on the internet does not mean that there is a license to use it and reproducing it on your own website will be a copyright infringement unless there is some authority. Now, there are banks, there are there are libraries of free images available, and if an image is free what it means is that there's a copyright license available for it. Um, and, and that's absolutely fine if you use those, but if you don't, then there's likely to be a copyright infringement. And if there's an infringement, then the copyright owner is probably entitled to damages and an injunction to take down. So what should you do? In any response, don't admit anything, but look into it, work out where did the image come from, who put it there, what use is it being you made for? and if it is, if there is no strong defence, it's not, for instance, clearly come from uh, a royalty-free licensing source, an open source uh, library, or there is no license in place, then then get it taken down, stop damages running, not least because you want to avoid the possibility of flagrancy damages. There are additional damages available in copyright infringement for flagrancy. Um, what are your options? You can ignore, but if you do ignore then you're going to get escalating claims. There's a risk of court action and a lot of these claimants will sue and there are small claims tracks available now in the UK. Uh, you can try to negotiate, um, you can ask them to prove copyright ownership um, and you can look at what a possible damages award might be and make a counter offer to the number that's being demanded. In most cases 
the the more credible and some of these some of these bodies that you might get letters from are are are, are, are perfectly proper and credible organizations like say getty images getty images will typically ask for a number of which is a which is a three figure sum it might be a high fig, three figure sum the reality is that by the time you've even thought about defending the case or certainly instructed lawyers to deal with it you're, you're going to be spending more than the appropriate license fee is and it's probably best in those sort of cases uh, to make a payment there there are instances where you may want to take a view on on fighting it and we've got a client at the moment which is fighting one of these because effectively they had taken the image down and and paid a number and then got a claim following up they were still using it because it was available on a cached page on the website that you couldn't actually you couldn't navigate to through the website but there was a cached page somewhere in the internet um, that they've been unable to take it down from and, and there is there is we've received advice from a german firm on whether under current german law that that still constitutes um, a publication um, but in a lot of these cases i'm afraid the advice is if there is an image that has been used without authority the the, the right and, and most pragmatic and most cost efficient way of dealing with the case is to make an appropriate payment and what can you do to uh, prevent this sort of thing happening? Well, some internal training, particularly to those people responsible for websites, to make sure that they understand the, the essentials of copyright law and the fact that, and, and this is something we very often hear from web developers, it was, you know, I could access it for free. That doesn't mean it's free to take a copy of it and put it on your own website and making sure that that, that disconnect is understood by your web developers is, I think, um, very important. Put some policies in place, um, have a review process and, and some regular checks on what you're putting up there. Um, and those may well help, help this next point. Um, I mentioned earlier that, that there are damages available for flagrancy um, and uh, that's additional damage is over and above the actual loss. Um, in the absolute lofts case, which was a, a photography case, it was a, a website advertising the defendant's uh, loft conversion services and they've used a picture that they'd taken from the claimant the claimant had notified them and they'd refused to take it down um, and the claimant sued for copyright infringement in the intellectual property enterprise court um, and the court assessed the loss that the claimant had suffered as, as a sort of notional royalty for use of the picture at about 300 pounds but because the defendant had known it was a copyright work and had not taken it down. It was held that they were flagrantly infringing and the court assessed £6,000 worth of damages for, for flagrancy. Um, in, in most of the cases where there's been damages awarded for flagrancy, the, actual, the damages awarded for flagrancy have been a multiple of the actual loss. Um, so if you've got policies in place that you can point to, that's going to help you argue that you haven't flagrantly infringed and it's an accident and, and you're very sorry, my lad. Um, so that sort of awareness, I think, is the best way of avoiding these sort of rather annoying claims. Working patterns and employer initiatives. We've, we've all changed the way we've worked over the last, I was going to say 18 months. It feels like 18 months, but it's not actually. It's only 15 months, isn't it? But working patterns have undoubtedly changed. Uh, and even before lockdown, I think working patterns were changing. Um, and... There's a question as to what impact this is having on, on, on IP ownership. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a case in the, uh, again, in the Intellectual Property Enterprise Court uh, around employer ownership. The starting point with UK law for intellectual property rights is that where uh, an, an in, a work is created, where an invention is made or a copyright work is created in the course of employment, uh, ownership automatically belongs to the employer. Um, and, and in the patents design, uh, Copyright Designs and Patents Act, it goes on to say that in relation to patents, that the, the course of employment will mean the course of normal or specifically assigned duties where an invention might result or where there's a special obligation on, on the employee to further the interests of the employer. Um, so the course of employment, now, in this case, Penhalurik and, and MD5, Mr. Penhalurik was a software developer who was employed by the claimant for 10 years, just about. Um, and he wrote software, which actually is quite clever software, allowed the police to analyze contents of computers without, without corrupting or altering them. This is for, for 
gathering evidence. Uh, there were six specific works that had been created and they comprised software, source code and, and a graphical user interface. Um, and during the 10 years he worked for, for MD5, Mr. Penhelirik had had several different employment contracts. Um, he left in 2016, as I say, and, and MD5 continued to, to offer for sale the software that he developed for them. Um, and he then chose to sue MD5 for copyright infringement on the basis that they didn't own the copyright and that he did. Um, and his argument was uh, based on a number of facts, but amongst those were that actually a lot of the work he'd done on this software was, was mostly done, in fact, during his lunch times and in the evenings and not during his working hours. Um, and that he'd used his home computer to write the software. Um, and that therefore it wasn't written in the course of employment and did not belong to the employer. And the judge commented, and, and this is uh, very much in line with what we'd have expected, that actually in assessing whether, whether something's been created in the course of employment, you've, you've got to look at a number of factors. What does the employment contract say? Is the work integral to the business? Would it have been open to the to the creator, to the author of the work, to, to refuse to create the work? What level of direction has the, the employee been subject to in, in, in producing the work? Where did the materials that we used to create the work come from? Who provided them? Um, there, is, there is an element of whether they were created in normal hours and, and actually an element of, of, of where the work was created. But you look at all those factors in the whole to establish whether the work was created in the course of employment. You'll be relieved to know that in this case, um, the court held that a software developer employed to develop software could not argue that just because he'd worked at home and outside his normal working hours, the software he'd written wasn't developed in the course of employment. So, so Mr. Penhalyrick's claim failed and MD5 was held to be the owner of the copyright. Um, so it's a reassuring decision, but 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 these are sort of issues I think we're going to see more of, as I say, with the change in working patterns and actually in, in, in change of working contracts. What about the sort of gig economy and the zero hours contracts? How, how easy is it going to be there to establish whether something was written in the course of employment or not? Um, so what are some of the takeaway tips from, from this? Well, make sure that employment contracts do accurately describe what a person is employed to do. And actually, equally importantly there, make sure that when a person's role changes, there is a record made of the change in that role. Equally, if, if you're asking someone to do specific, if you're giving them specific instructions, if we go back to uh, the provision of, of the Patents Act, uh, course of, uh, so specifically assigned duties, if someone is assigned specific duties, then make sure that a, that a record is kept of the fact they've been assigned those specific duties. And, and bear in mind whether a role is likely to result in the creation of intellectual property um, of the kind that's in question. So uh, there are cases between uh, universities and academics where academics have argued successfully in a couple of instances that they're not employed to invent, they're employed to teach. And that any invention they've made whilst being an academic at the university has not been an invention made in the course of employment. Um, now, if that, if that can be decided in, in a case with an academic, it can certainly, for instance, be decided in a case with a, a doctor and a health trust um, or any employee who, who might not be expected to create intellectual property works, but does. And so think carefully about employment contracts and description of roles. Um, timing and, and tools which lead to the creation are relevant, but, but actually what really matters is what does the person normally do or what have they specifically been asked to do? Um, and to the extent possible, include assignment clauses in contracts. Um, a clause in an employment contract which goes beyond the provisions of the Patents Act, the CDPA in terms of, of, of rights and invention, is unenforceable against an employee, but only insofar as it goes beyond the Act. So. Um, it's worth putting in clauses which, which uh, assign to the employer rights that the employee creates, which are, re which are, which are relevant to the employer's business. 
Um, but all of those things are things you should be thinking about in terms of ensuring ownership of, of works that your employees create. Okay, so how are we going after Brexit? Um, the first thing to say is good news on, on, on the cloned rights. You'd probably be familiar, you've probably been over, over familiar with the number of briefings you'd have received about the fact that um, existing European Union intellectual property rights, which were in existence immediately before midnight on the 31st of December, were, were going to be cloned to give an equivalent UK right post the cloning. Our, our experience so far is that that process has worked almost perfectly. Um, and we've, we've yet to find any example of an EU right that hasn't been replicated or, or in fact of any uh, any incorrect replication. So, so that has gone has gone very smoothly. Um, we haven't yet really seen any cases in respect of the, um, the continuing unregistered rights that arose out of EU unregistered rights immediately before Brexit. Um, but no reason to believe that, that that isn't going to work smoothly in the courts. Where we are beginning to see some issues, the first one is, is that an issue that wasn't addressed pre-Brexit that needs to be quite urgently is the question of exhaustion of rights. So the exhaustion of rights is, is, is where uh, a rights owner puts a good on the market, which embody those rights. When they put it on the market, the rights are exhausted. We have had in the, when we were in the European Union, we had exhaustion of rights across the European Union. So if a, if, a, if a rights owner put their patented good on the market in Spain, then the rights are exhausted throughout the European Union, similarly with copyright or trademark works. Now that we're outside the European Union, we no longer benefit from that. So uh, there is no automatic exhaustion of rights in a, in a trademark good. If, if, if you buy a pair of Levi's in Spain and resell them in the UK, you don't automatically benefit from EU exhaustion of rights. And theoretically, that could be a trademark infringement in, in the UK. We, uh, the, the IPO has started a consultation on what the approach should be. And there are four possible um, approaches that are, are, are being suggested. One, one is what they call the unilateral EEA exhaustion, which is that the UK should treat as exhausted rights in any goods sold in the EEA with the, with the rights owner's consent. And that wouldn't be reciprocal. So goods sold by a rights owner in the UK will not have their rights in, exhausted in the, in the European Union or the EEA. Another is a purely national approach so that rights in goods are only exhausted if they are first put on the market by the rights owner in the UK. Another is international. So wherever the goods are first put on the market by the by the rights owner or with the rights owner's consent, the rights are exhausted. Um, and, and many of you will be old enough to remember the sort of flurry of cases, perhaps 20 years ago around genes, uh, Asda famously importing genes from New York and reselling them and being sued by, by Levi's. Um, well, the approach that the international approach would be that, as I say, goods sold anywhere with the rights owner's consent could be sold in the UK. Again, that that wouldn't be reciprocal. Um, and and then there's the suggestion of a mixed approach. So this would differ according to what the rights were or where the goods had originally been sold. And actually, sounds like sounds like a a, a very good way to generate a lot of litigation and some and some significant chaos in in terms of what you can and can't do with goods in which it has probably rights um, subsist. Anyway, as I say, there is an IPO consultation on this. It's quite a big issue um, because we haven't really had a lot of parallel importing cases for several years now. And I, I suspect we may well get a lot depending on which way this goes. And uh, anyone who's interested uh, can, can go to the IPO page and look at the consultation. Um, and we are, we are contemplating having um, a series of, of consultation conversations, meetings with clients to get views and because we're going to respond and, and put our views in. So anyone who's interested in, in, in participating in an exercise where, where a response is given to the IPO on the correct approach to exhaustion, um, drop us a line after this and, and we'll put you on the mailing list for those. Um, where else are we seeing divergence? Well, this is an interesting case. That's, that's, a, that's a VESPA. Um, and uh, recently in the Italian courts, uh, the validity of that trademark was challenged 
Uh, this is a three-dimensional trademark for the shape of the Vespa motor scooter. Um, the, the challenge was based on uh, a couple of arguments. Um, one that the shape was lacked the distinctive character necessary to um, give a trademark validity. Um, and, and secondly, that, that the shape or many elements of the shape were, 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 were elements which are necessary for a technical result. Well, in Italy, that case has failed and that mark has been held to be valid and, and therefore enforceable. Um, and we can compare that with the approach that was recently taken in the UK courts um, and a case that we're involved in where uh, Jaguar Land Rover had filed um, applications for 3D trademark, very similar line images, but of a different vehicle for the, for the original Defender shape. Um, and in the UK courts, um, the challenge to validity was, was successful um, on effectively both of, those, both of those grounds. So we can see there that already there's a significant divergence, at least in trademark law and the law of 3D trademarks between the EU and the UK. I have to say, I suspect that we'd have seen that divergence anyway, and then what we would have ended up doing would have been having um, a case in front of the CJU, but obviously that's, that's no longer available for a UK litigant. Um, but, but that's one significant area where we're seeing divergence already and no suggestion that that will come back together. Mm. Perhaps more encouraging or less encouraging, depending on your, on your stance. Uh, another case that's been decided recently was, was TuneIn versus Warner Music. This was an appeal court case. And this was to do with, with TuneIn, which is a, an online radio station. Um, and actually what I, on TuneIn does is it makes available online radio stations from across the world. If you're a TuneIn subscriber, you can listen to radio from virtually anywhere in the world if it's online radio. Um, the allegation made by Warner Brothers and others in this case was that that infringed copyright in the UK by, by making these works available, by making particularly music that was played on radio stations in say Gabon available in the UK to, to, to users. Um, in that case, uh, the judge found in favour of the music producers. In most cases, there are different classes of radio station that were made available through TuneIn. Um, this was appealed, um, and uh, part of the reason for the reason for the appeal was that there was some conflict between existing CJU cases, that is pre-Brexit CJU cases. Um, but but the appellant here, TuneIn, did ask the court to to diverge from CJU practice. Said this is a case where the court should use the new powers that were given under the 2018 Act to um, to not follow CJU law. Um, but also interesting, there was a post-Brexit CJU case which the parties looked at, this, this case of VJ Built Kunst. Um, and uh, that held that copyright owners had deemed to have put limits on, on communications to the public, which was quite an important issue in this particular case. Um, and in that case, the Court of Appeal decided that it was it wasn't going to diverge from CJU law. It didn't feel this was a case that justified that. And and also, although it wasn't bound by the built Kunst case, decided that it was going to take note of and follow the built Kunst case um, because it formed part of a body of CGA law and was based on all of the same international um, agreements that, that the that the earlier CJU law was, was, was based on and, and effectively that British law remained the same as it had been prior to Brexit. Um, there's an interesting uh, note there from uh, one of the Court of Appeal judges who, who noted that um, perhaps the English courts need to take a view on how they hand down their judgments and not make themselves effectively bound by law that CJU law as it stands at a particular date um, because they then can't take account of, of, of later CJU judgments. So an interesting case um, and, and one that suggests that for the moment, at least, the English courts are not looking for an opportunity to diverge from European law. Um, and then the final issue I'm going to talk about, this, 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 um, this is an interesting case um, for lots of reasons, not least because it's um, very accessible in terms of the facts, but also um, because 
it follows a line of, of I think, slightly confusing case law. So those of you who are familiar with patent law will know that a patent can't be granted for invention that was made available to the public before the priority date. And the priority date is the date when you apply for your patent. Um, and what this means is that one of the things that, a, that an inventor can't do is make their invention public before they file a patent application. Um, and in the, the, there have been a body of cases around this in the Lux traffic controls case versus Pike. Um, this was to do with, with those sort of emergency traffic light systems that happen where you've got roadworks. And, and in that case, the patentee Lux had trialed its, its new control system, which was in a black box. And the black box was in the bottom of a hole in the ground where roadworks were being done, controlling traffic lights. And the hole in the ground had barriers around it. And there was no evidence that anybody had gone over the barriers or climbed into the hole or looked inside the black box. And you just needed to do all of those things to understand the, the invention that was in, in the system in the black box. But the court held that despite all of that, the black box was in a public place, that a member of the public could have climbed over the barriers, gone down into the hole, taken the, box, taken the lid off the box and looked inside. Um, and therefore, that trial was a making available to the public and the patent wasn't valid. Uh, it seemed at the time to be a harsh decision, and I still think it's a harsh decision, but that was the decision in Lux and Pike. In folding attic stairs, um, we, get, we get a really a really difficult decision to uh, to put on, on on to put on the level with Lux because in folding attic stairs, um, folding attic stairs were being awarded. They were getting they were getting a prize at a ministerial visit, and they had the public in and photographers, and um, in the background in the room that the photographers and the minister were and the members of the public who had come to see the minister giving them their their award was um, the later to be patented invention. Um, and the, the, the court there held that the public had a right there, they're, they're deemed to have a right to access the information, but nobody had done, nobody had gone and looked at it, and nobody had, had, um, had taken advantage of the right they had to go and access the information. Um, and nobody was particularly interested because they were there to see the minister give them an award. And that wasn't a publication. So very difficult to reconcile those two decisions um, more recently, we've got this Clayton Yieldometer versus, I'm going to call it Missouri, but I may be wrong, um, case, which is, um, which is a very recent case. It's come out in the last couple of weeks. And, and in Clayton, what we have is a farmer who has invented a new seed drill, which is attached to the back of a tractor. There's a figure from the patent application there. Um, so the inventive concept here related to the layout of the drill and the reduced re weed growth between the rows that, that this drill gave you. Um, now, this farmer was a farmer. He had, he, had, he had fields on his farm and he tested this in a field on a private land on private land. Um, however, the field was visible from nearby roads and there was a public footpath that went down the side of the field. Um, and uh, it was held that a member of the public who'd been on the footpath or on the road, if they'd seen the tractor being driven up and down, would have been able to understand the invention if they'd been an expert in seed drills. There was no evidence that anyone had done. Um, uh, and the farmer had, uh, he said, taken steps to make sure that if he saw any member of the public, he could, he could hide his drill. He was aware of the, of the, of the dangers of pre-publication. Um, but in this case, the court held that the fact that a member of the public could have seen the seed drill and could have looked at the pattern of the of the way the soil had been um, drilled and and work back to the invention, despite the fact that there was no evidence anyone had done, meant that the patent was not a valid patent because it had been anticipated. So we're we're back, it seems, to a sort of Lux versus Pike position, um, which again it seems rather harsh on the farmer here. But, but that is something worth bearing in mind um, if you are involved in a business that is, is developing new technologies. Um, very important to make sure that they're not, they're not prior published. So what you do, uh, conduct research on private premises and away from prying eyes or the possibility of prying eyes. Do think about the possibility of anything being seen and what can be done to stop it. Um, and if you are working with third parties, if you're trialing 
um, equipment, for instance, make sure that there are confidentiality agreements and notices in place so that there is an obligation of confidence because an obligation of confidence means that it's not a, it's not a publication. Uh, thank you. Um, slightly longer than I anticipated, but I'm very happy to take some questions if anybody has any. Simon, do you have any? Yeah, th thanks very much, uh, Mark. And it's good to see, of course, as we would expect, appropriate credits under all the pictures on your slides, which is uh, <laughs> something I personally might not always observe, but that's, uh, that is, Mark did it the right way. Um, questions. We, we had a um, uh, question, uh, actually, uh, uh, one proposed attendee sent in before the um, uh, seminar a couple of days ago. So maybe go to that one first. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it, it was sort of for everyone's benefit, a two-part one. So basically, how thoroughly does the trademark registration process look at existing names and logos and how confident we should be in the protection? Sorry, my cat has just arrived on my screen. Um, go away. Uh, and then a, a reference uh, to, uh, you know, it, it do bigger, better resourced organisations sort of use economic might to uh, enforce perhaps dodgy trademarks which don't really deserve the protection so so what do you have to say about that okay so the, the first one is uh, so what what do the registry do in terms of looking at existing marks if you apply for a trademark to the registry um the the examination that the registry will conduct relates only really to whether the mark has an inherent distinctive character so the registry will refuse a mark if you apply to it for a mark which is descriptive and lacks the capability of being distinctive. Um, but the registry itself will not at that stage consider the similarity to earlier marks that are owned by other people. What they will do, however, is they'll do those searches. And if there are potentially similar marks, they will notify the owners of those marks of your application. So if I file a trademark application for Nike, they won't refuse it because there are marks for Nike already, but they will tell Nike that I've applied for it and Nike can decide whether or not they want to object to my trademark. So, uh, so, when you, so, so, so when a trademark is applied for, the registry is, is not going to consider in this examination procedure whether it's too similar to earlier marks. That's for the, right, the rights owners of those earlier marks to raise as an issue with the registry to oppose the, the registration. Um, the second question, um, around do effectively do, does having deep pockets give you an unfair advantage um, and do and do deep pocketed companies exploit the system um, I think undoubtedly there's an element to which the answer has to be yes there is there is a benefit in litigation having deep pockets um, and what you will see is that in the trademark world Companies with large portfolios and, and significant IP budgets will oppose other people's applications and will litigate. Um, and litigation is expensive. Um, so is there an unfair bias in favor of deep pocketed companies? Inevitably, there still is to some extent. It's not as it's certainly not as bad as when I first came into intellectual property law 30 something years ago. Um, and the Intellectual Property Enterprise Court has helped that significantly. Um, and I think it would be unfair to tar all big companies with the same brush. There are some who actually are very rational and sensible. We, we, had, um, we had an issue recently with a very large company on one side and our clients on the other side. It was a much smaller company. And I have to say that although their lawyers were particularly aggressive and unpleasant. Actually, the company itself was very, very sensible. Um, and our client ended up doing a deal with the general counsel at the, at the, at the client, which, which his lawyers would not have made available to him, um, um, which I was quite impressed by. So, so unfair to tar all companies with the same brush, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say now I'm, I'm impressed by the GC at Go Compare. <laughs> very very good um i don't know if that individual's on this this call but they are suitably complimented uh, we've had a, a couple of other questions uh, an observation that uh, someone's dealing with this sort of stuff today so your talk is very timely so that's good um and any help needed you've got <laughs> uh, we've had a, a quite specific question here um, have you had any cases where individuals take assignment of an image after it was put on a free photo website 
such as Unsplash by the original author. So I assume original author puts it on the free website, but then original author also then assigns it to, to third party. Does that assignee, can they then claim copyright infringement against any users of the image uh, who began using it via the free photo website before the assignment? Okay, now that, yes. So the answer to the first question is, have we have we seen that? Have we had a case where that's happened? No, I haven't. <laughs> um, what, what would be the legal position? Uh, well, the first thing is there, that would be an evidential minefield. But um, m my view is that if, if the original copyright owner has put it on, a, on an open source, a free, a, a free licensing platform, and you have used it subject to that free licensing platform's terms and conditions, and, and bear in mind that when you use a work from a free licensing platform, you are using it subject to certain conditions. It's not that there's no copyright in it, it's that you've got a license on terms and conditions of that license. Then, then you're clearly not infringing because there is a, a there is a license. Um, it's then assigned to the new owner who decides they don't want it to be on free license. Your your acts before then cannot be an infringement because they were clearly done with license. The question then is, can that license be terminated? And that is a question. There are two contracts there in play. One is the original license that has been granted, or, or the contract between the original rights owner and the platform under which they made it available, because there will be a contract between those two under which the platform can make it available for a free license, and whether that's a license that can be terminated, and, and whether the assignee takes it subject to that license, which I think they probably do. Um, and then secondly, the question of whether the license the platform has, has given is a license that can be terminated, um, and if so, what the notice period for that is, and whether notice needs to be given, which I suspect it does. So I. I most likely, I think, is that both of those probably can be terminated, but that the new owner has to terminate those and notice has to be given terminating the license before Fun. it becomes an infringement would would be my best guess on vague facts. Mm. If, if that happens in, yeah. you know, in, in reality, then then we need to look at all those contracts. And Indeed. Facts. This is not legal advice. I think everyone accepts that. <laughs> We've had a couple of uh, actually very similar questions, which I think are asking the, the same point. Um, dealing with ownership of copyright or, or similar IP works created by self-employed contractor individuals is including an express assignment or license in the contract with that contractor the only way yes. for the engaging party to have yeah. lawful use? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, not quite. Um, but if you are engaging with a self-employed contractor or or even with a third party, so, so actually most of the case law around that sort of issue um, relates to marketing or, or design agencies and the development of logos. So the two the two lead cases are the Doc Martins case, as I'm going to call it, and the Innocent Smoothie case, um, which in both cases related to the development of of logos for Doc Martins and, and I can't remember the name Doc Martins, but they're, they're a company in Northampton uh, uh, and Innocent Smoothie, where um, a, a graphic designer company, not individual, designed logos for them to use as trademarks. And you'll be familiar with both logos, many of the people on, on the call. And then there was disputes to copyright ownership. And in neither case was there a, a, a legal assignment of copyright in the works. But in both of those cases, the court held that the, the clear intent of the, uh, of the parties when they entered into that agreement was that Doc Martin's Innocent Smoothies would be entitled to use those logos going forward and that there was therefore an equitable assignment of rights. Um, now, in most cases where clearly a work has been developed for use by the by the person commissioning it, there's going to be some form of implied license if there is no assignment. The scope of that license may be unclear. You may not always be in a position where, where it's as clear as it was in those two cases. Um, so you're very unwise to rely on the court coming up with some sort of equitable mm -hmm. assignment. Uh, if you are dealing with a third party who is not an employee and they are creating a copyright work for you, then I would say it is essential that you get a copyright assignment in your contract with them. If they won't assign copyright, then at least a license on clear terms so that you know what it is you can do with it. 
Okay, that's that's brilliant. T time for one very quick question, and then we'll have to to wrap up since we've slightly uh, exceeded our, our uh, allotted time with everyone. And thank you for for staying on, everyone who has. Um, any questions we don't get to, if the the it's, questions being put up by a named person, will I'm sure uh, be in touch to 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 have a word with you. But the last question is is around where. Um, a third party is either using a similar mark or is applying to register a similar mark to you. What's the difference between what the trademark registry might notify you of and what a watch service company might notify you of? Um, the trademark registry will, will form a view as to similarity. They have to because they'll, they'll, do, they'll do a similar search to what the watch service does a search and they'll form a view. They may form a view that's different from yours. The watch service will give you all of their results and let you form a view, or will tell you which ones they think are similar, but they'll also tell you ones, you know, and that they're likely to be more inclusive. You are, you are, what you are gonna get from, from the registry is situations where they think there is a clear similarity, which is too close. Whereas what you're going to get from a watch service is, is, is those that fall into a more of a grey area as well. Most of the interesting cases are around that grey area. So I don't, I mean, depend, I mean, de to an extent, it depends on the value of your trademarks to a business. But if, if trademarks are important to a business and, and most branded businesses, they're the core of the business to an extent, um, I would I would seriously consider having a watch service rather than simply relying on the registry to tell me if I've got a problem. Because when someone's applying for a mark, that's the that early, probably before they've started to use it or before they made significant use of it, you're, you're, you're more likely to be able to reach a resolution at that point than after they've spent a lot of money getting up and running and developing the brand. Marvellous. Well, fan fantastic. Thanks very much. Um, that That's all we have time for everyone. Thank you so much for attending. It's good to see so many of you there. Um, uh, you know, any links and things we send around asking for ideas for future such talks as this, please do let us know what you want, because we genuinely do monitor it and listen to it and try to provide what, uh, what the in-house legal community seeks from these talks. Um, so uh, in the meantime, um, that's all we have for for you today. So thank you, Mark, very much for that very interesting talk. Thank and you. thank you, everyone, for attending. And I hope to see you at a future one of these. Thanks very much. Cheers, everyone.